Hello, and welcome to the Julia Morgan Legacy Event. I'm Nan Friedman with the Annenberg Community Beach House. The Beach House is a public destination on Santa Monica State Beach, operated by the city of Santa Monica, and it's open to all. This is our first virtual Julia, Mer Julia Morgan Legacy Event, and we're so pleased that you've joined us today. Since opening in 2009, the Annenberg Community Beach House has been a, bu a bustling public destination with year-round programming. We offer an array of things to do in arts and culture, recreation, as a place to host meetings and events, or shoot a commercial or a feature film. But the Beach House site has a legacy going back almost 100 years, and that legacy includes architect Julia Morgan. The beautiful five-acre property where the Beach House now lives was first developed in the late 1920s when media mogul William Randolph Hearst built a beach house estate for his paramour, actress Marion Davies. He employed architect Julia Morgan, California's first licensed female architect, to complete the project. She was also completing Hearst Castle at San Simeon around the same time. Since 2009, the beach house has partnered with the Santa Monica Conservancy whose dedicated docent volunteers have connected the past to the present for thousands of visitors each year. Docents share the legacy of these three remarkable individuals, actress, philanthropist, businesswoman, and famed party hostess, Marion Davies, media mogul, William Randolph Hearst, and architect, Julia Morgan. Each March during Women's History Month, the Beach House and Conservancy pay our respects to Julia Morgan with a special program. We invite you to find out more about the Beach House at annenbergbeachhouse.com and about the Conservancy at smconservancy.org. And now I would like to introduce you to Ruth Ann Lehrer, Santa Monica Conservancy board member and Beach House Pro, uh, docent program manager. And again, thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate Julia Morgan. Thank you, Nan. That was a wonderful introduction. Welcome everybody. Um, Julia Morgan was indeed a remarkable woman and a brilliant architect whose accomplishments went unappreciated and unrecognized for many years. She died in 1957, a time when international style modernism was sweeping the world of architecture so that her mastery and invention in working with historical styles was unre unrecognized and rejected. But in 2014, Julia Morgan was awarded the American Institute of Architecture's Gold Medal, its highest honor, and the first one ever granted to a woman. The Annenberg Community Beach House is proud to be part of her legacy. She came there for Mr. Hurst to build a mansion started by an art designer at MGM because her expertise with structural engineering were necessary for building on sand. She took over design and construction of the mansion. The pool and the guest house, which survive today, are completely her designs. Julia Morgan Legacy Day has been an annual celebration since 2012, when the statewide commemoration honoring Miss Morgan's 150th birthday took place. March is Women's History Month, and it's also the month in which Julia Morgan became the first woman ever to receive her professional architect's license from the state of California in 1904. Conservancy docents offer tours of the site, and we hope to see you there again in the near future. Now, let me introduce our speaker, Karen McNeil. Dr. McNeil is a leading expert on Julia Morgan and has published multiple articles about her. The next one, due in the fall, will be about the Paris years. Dr. McNeil's work focuses on women and gender in the architectural profession, as well as how progressive era women use the built environment to expand their roles in society as consumers, reformers, educators, and professionals. Her work has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Autry National Center, the Bancroft Library, and the University of California Humanities Research Institute. Beyond her work on Julia Morgan, Karen has taught history and architectural history at colleges and universities in the San Francisco Bay Area and has been involved in historic preservation as well. She's currently senior family historian at Ascent Private Capital Management at US Bank and serves on the board of trustees of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, supporting the past, present and future of women in architecture and engineering. 
Her talk is called Julia Morgan and the Men Who Built Hearst Castle. We'll take questions at the end. Please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Hello, Karen. Hello, Ruthann. Thank you, Ruthann and Nan, for those beautiful introductions. Um, and thank you for inviting me back to the Annenberg Beach House Julia Morgan, Morgan Legacy event. Um, like most people, I would love to be down there with you, but what a crowd we have today. Probably the space couldn't handle this many people. And I know that some people are coming from further afield. So there are some upsides, I suppose, to this pandemic experience of the Legacy event. For all of you who are from further afield, I encourage you to visit the Annenberg Beach House whenever you're let out of your houses and you can go traveling again and visit Santa Monica. I love the space. It's a fantastic organization and community resource. So now, without further ado, I will start. And uh, as Ruthann just said, I am more than happy to take questions. Um, I'll take them at the end of the talk and you can just put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, whenever you hear something that, that you know, prompts a question. All right, so I'm gonna go really quickly through a bunch of slides and then I'll slow down. And quick review, I know a lot of you probably know Julia Morgan generally, but a quick review of her amazing accomplishments. In 1902, she became the first woman to graduate from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts um, and she had been the first woman admitted in 1898. In 1904, she became the first woman in California to earn her California Arkansas established her the only women to run an architectural practice that hired both men and women. She ran it for over 40 years and it was one of the most prolific practices as well producing hundreds of residential buildings, um, mostly in San Francisco, Berkeley, and Oakland, but throughout California, especially. Dozens of churches, schools, and commercial buildings. And nearly 100 buildings for organizations related to the California women's movement, including um, at least 30 buildings for the YWCA in at least 17 locations. In 1929, the University of California, Berkeley, her undergraduate alma mater, um, awarded Julie Morgan its highest uh, honor at the time, the, an honorary doctor of laws degree. Um, Mills College offered her once a few years later, but Morgan was really too busy working on the castle and the YWCA's and the beach house and things. Um, in 1940, the Women's Board of the um, in, um, Golden Gate International Exposition named Julia Morgan one of the most influential women in the state of California for her contributions to architecture. And in 2014, Julia Morgan earned the AIA gold medal, the American Institute of Architects gold medal, which is the highest honor that that organization um, can confer. It only took 57 years after Julia Morgan's death and 107 years after the award was established, but she won it. And she was the first, she was the first woman to earn that award. So that's a remarkable career, no matter what, but it's particularly remarkable if you think about a woman practicing in a male dominated career to say the least in the early 20th century. So how is it even possible? Well, she had supportive parents, Charles and Eliza Morgan, she had key mentors as right after her undergraduate years at Berkeley, architect Bernard Maybeck took her under his wing and hired her. He, she worked with him for 18 months and he encouraged her to go to Paris. She also had her mother's cousin's husband, Pierre Lebrun, who worked for a prominent New York architecture um, company, Napoleon Lebrun and Sons. I still haven't found a picture of Pierre, but this is the um, firm's most famous building uh, the Metropolitan Life Tower overlooking Madison Square. During Morgan's childhood, the firm was in charge of designing all of the firehouses in New York City. In Paris, Morgan would not have been able to get into the Ecole des Beaux-Arts if it hadn't been for 
women who women artists who organized and fought for years to gain access to the classrooms and to the degree programs at the Ecole. And Morgan knew these women. They supported her and they helped her um, have the courage to keep pursuing her studies at the Ecole, even though the odds were against her. She also had almost every single door closed in her face in terms of the ateliers in Paris. The men did not want to train a woman. They did not want a woman in her atelier, but two men did. The more important one was Francois Benjamin Chosmiche, who really got her through the exams and then mentored her through her um, years at the Ecole. When she returned to um, the United States, Morgan needed clients and she particularly benefited from some very prominent patrons. Phoebe Hurst is probably the most significant of all of them. In the Hurst family, Phoebe Hurst is by far the more important figure than William, which might sound strange, but without Phoebe, you wouldn't have Hurst Castle as we know it or the beach house as we know it. All of that said, if Morgan had all the friends in the world who wanted her career to succeed. She had the best education in the world in the field of architecture. So many people were on her side, but if she couldn't command the authority over the men who were going to build her designs, then you'd see a fraction, if anything, of Julia Morgan's career. And we're talking a super masculine, group of builders, glazers, pump, plumbers, roofers, general contractors, uh, electricians, all of the building tra trades, which were a very powerful group of people at the time. For example, Morgan did not, Morgan understood this very early on. The Campanile at Mills College was arguably her most um, important commission, but it was her first non-residential independent commission. And it was a very important structure for Mills College, which then as now it was struggling to, to stay alive in, in the context of higher education at that time. And uh, the builder, so it's this reinforced concrete um, bell tower and the builder, Bernard Ransom, his father was the most preeminent uh, uh, person, builder in the reinforced concrete construction technology in the United States at the time. He had more patents than anybody. They were the expert family bar none. And Bernard Ransom did not like this young woman telling him what to do at the building site. And he did whatever he could to undermine her authority at the building site, so much so that when the um, ceremonies, the un grant, uh, unveiling ceremonies occurred in 1904 for the Campanile, Bernard Ransom got top billing on the Campanile, even though it's very much Julia Morgan's design. She's the one who envisioned using reinforced concrete to begin with. He just completely undermined her authority. Keep that in mind. Imagine how much more difficult it would be to manage up to a hundred men at a time on a hilltop in remote California on a huge project. And the men too, they weren't just from all those building trades. They, it was an international mix of men. You had uh, Mexican American men, Filipinos, um, Italians, Polish, English, Irish, it was an international group of men, all the different languages being spoken. And just imagine, there's just no way that this project could have been completed if Julia Morgan couldn't somehow command authority over those men and earn their respect. So I'm gonna focus mostly on Hearst Castle today to answer this question about how did Julia Morgan actually earn the respect? and authority. First, Morgan and Hearst. Um, lots of people like to note how they seem like an unlikely pair. She was five feet tall with a very timorous voice, um, incredibly self-deprecating and modest. And he was this big guy and, you know, this, he, he created a war to get headlines, right, in 1898. 
Um, he was a politician, he was notorious, right? So how could they possibly, uh, how could this unlikely pair meet and why? Well, they may have met during the construction of the Greek theater at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Phoebe Hearst basically told her son that he had to uh, commission, build this theater in honor of his father, her husband, George Hearst. And so William Randolph Hearst did. He might have met Morgan during those years. He also may have met Morgan at the Hacienda del Pozo de Verona, which was his mother's estate in Pleasanton, California. And Morgan was working on that commission from 1903 to 1910 or something like that. She was frequently there, William was frequently there. They easily could have met at that time. By 1908, William Randolph Hearst was hiring Morgan himself. And a couple of things come to mind. He probably liked her aesthetic. He, he liked that. He probably understood that she worked for the clients. She listened to them and produced what they wanted. Uh, there was a quality already by 1908. He knew that there was a high quality to Morgan's architecture, that Campanile that I showed you earlier. It withstood the earthquake and fires of 1906 without a scratch and catapulted her to um, you know, a position of not just being like a society architect and a yay, go girls kind of architect, but a, a, a quality architect. Right, and then she oversaw the reconstruction of the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, which was enormously complicated. So he knew the quality was there. And then there's another thing with Hearst that he also probably uh, understood and respected above all. As I said, he was this notorious public figure. He already was by 1908 and he remained a notorious figure throughout his lifetime. Morgan respected her client's privacy and he knew that he could trust her not to say anything about him, not to say anything about the projects, not to be talkative to the press and, um, and, and just breach any sort of, of, of propriety. So anyway, in 1908, he hired Morgan to uh, build his first estate in Sausalito. Sausalito wanted nothing to do with a Hearst estate. So it was never built. The retaining wall was built. In 1914, Julia Morgan designed the Examiner Building in Los Angeles. It is a massive structure that's still there. The University of Arizona is taking over it now. But you can see, you know, it's, it foreshadows some of the Hearst Castle aesthetics, the mixing of styles of Spanish colonial and Mexican, ornate on the inside with all that uh, gold um, leaf, all that detail and everything. Huge project completed in about 10 months. Um, this is where we should be today, but we are not. But when you go, this is my favorite bathroom in all of Julia Morgan's buildings, the lily pad bathroom. I just love the tiles. Fantastic. The monastery, the Santa, uh, the Santa Maria de Olivia, Olivia uh, from Spain. This is an enormously complex project. So Hearst had this monastery, he, he bought this monastery. It had to be taken apart, crated and shipped all the way, um, you know, across on the train to the port, across the Atlantic, across um, North America to California, where he was gonna rebuild it in Shasta County. And then he was going to rebuild it in Golden Gate Park. And that story like didn't happen, but it was an enormously complex, huge project that Morgan um, had to manage just getting it from Spain to North America was huge. And then finally, Wintoon up in Shasta County. This is the first site where he hoped that monastery would be built and it couldn't be done. So um, again, like so many of these projects, you know, they were huge. They were, the, there was no small scale when it came to William Randolph Hearst. Um, they were far flung. They required a lot of people from a lot of different trades. So again, there's just no way that these uh, projects could have been completed if Julia Morgan hadn't earned the respect and authority over all of those men who turned her designs into um, physical realities. So now to focus on Hearst Castle. So you might think that this is like the opportunity of a lifetime, a 20 to 30 year project, depending on how you date it. Um, 
using all the craftsmen you could possibly think of, just opulence. You know, for Morgan, I mean, she got to practice every single bit of her training um, from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And she got to work with warehouses of antiques and um, new and old, I mean, across the Renaissance from Roman times, from Asia, from mostly Europe. Um, she got to hire all sorts of artisans to create the caryatids and to turn her designs into sculptures. I mean, who doesn't want to work with a Renaissance sculpture of, of uh, David, right? The gold, the, the ceilings. You know, some of the ceilings, they're, they're vintage, right? They're the actual ceilings from the places in Europe, but other parts of them are reconstructions. And so the finest, she got to hire the finest artisans, right? The rugs, I mean, everything is just the opportunity of a lifetime to create something like this, is it not? I mean, again, she, get, she got to use all of her training. She even got to build bear shelters and chicken shelters, nothing. I, she got to do everything, right? She even got to feed an elephant. I mean, how many opportunities, how many people get that kind of opportunity? Amazing, right? Well, then you have the builder's side of the coin. You know, a lot of you have probably been to Hearst Castle and you know that to this day, it is in a pretty remote part of the California coastline one of the most pristine parts of the California coastline. It, you have to make an effort to get there now. Well, when it started in, when the project started in 1919, it was even more remote. There was actually a general strike going on in San Francisco, just, you know, a rather inauspicious start to, you know, working with the laborers who were gonna take on this enormous project. Morgan had to find a private boat to ship uh, Simeon, but even before they could unload it, they had to build a new pier because the original pier uh, was not adequate. So there was terrible infrastructure. Once the, the materials were taken off the boat, they had to be pulled up the hill by horse and carriage because there were no roads. Um, eventually, you know, the roads were built, that was like project number two, right? But here, if you see that, that truck, um, you know, you look at those wheels, there's a reason why they're called horseless carriages, right? They really were not that far off from carriage construction. And so there, obviously that truck couldn't handle a roadless hilltop, but then it's still this relatively tiny, um, a vehicle to pull everything that had to go up to the hilltop for years and years. It was back breaking labor on the top of the hill where the elements, it could be hot, it could be cold, windy, wet, you name it. And they have sun hats on those men, but no goggles, no hard hats. It was dangerous work. And again, backbreaking. On the picture on the right, if you look closely, you can see a trench. So, you know, hand digging the trenches to lay the pipes for the plumbing or the electrical or whatever it might be, carrying wheelbarrows of, of concrete, although they devised ways to work with that too. And again, you can see sun hats, but no hard hats. Um, this is about as sophisticated as some of the uh, vehicles got, the, the building construction equipment vehicles got. Landscaping, fantastic opportunity in some ways. Now for the, the men who had to plant everything, it's one thing to plant a palm tree once it made it up the hill. It's another thing to move an oak tree. Now Walter Steilberg, Julia Morgan's engineer, he actually, he was, he was pretty proud of himself for um, his solution to moving around the oak trees. And yay on Hearst, he didn't want to cut down the oak trees or let them die. He wanted to keep them and move them. But it was an incredibly difficult process. Um, and on the right is they created this concrete like barrel to put the um, oak tree in and then they rolled it on logs. The pergola. So, 
Hearst initially, he, uh, he constructed a hacienda in Halon, and you can actually stay there these days. It's right off 101. And it was built exactly a day's horse ride from the, from the, the main house, from the ranch, or from Hearst Castle. But it turned out that Hearst, the horse lover, his friends did not love horseback riding. And so Hearst said, well, okay, we'll do something simple and we'll create a pergola where our guests can enjoy a walk or a horseback ride in the shade of the wisteria covered pergola. Five miles, 10 miles, something like that. Lovely idea. From the laborer's perspective, they had to dig every single hole for each of those columns, create the forms for those columns, pour the concrete, and then they had to cut the lintels and then put them on top. Um, it was again, like everything at Hearst Castle was just a huge job. And this was during a time when there were no small number of projects that builders could work on. This is the, the um, the age of the streetcar suburbs. And actually now in the 1920s, cars were increasingly available, but you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, they were all growing rapidly. There were, e it was easy to get jobs in the building trades. So why would you bother leaving your family, leaving all the amenities, amenities of city life and going to this far flung location all alone for this man who was always changing his mind and asking for the impossible. You know, speaking of the impossible, here's the first, the beginnings of the Neptune pool, the outdoor pool at um, Hearst Castle. This is the first iteration of the pool. The second iteration of the pool, making it a little bit longer, a little bit rounder, um, adding some uh, smaller pool and the final iteration of the pool. So this is actually a, a temple, a Greek temple, ancient, um, with some new sculptures added in. And the sculptures on flanking the temple in particular, they were completed by a French sculptor whose name escapes me. But uh, it was a great opportunity for him. But Morgan had to communicate with this man in French and her French was kind of rusty. She hadn't been in Paris for 20 years, 30 years by this time. And so she had to communicate in French and Hearst was notorious for not paying his bills, including for this sculptor. So Morgan is dealing with this enormous project, all these other projects and having to deal with these artisans and builders who were not getting paid by Hearst. They really, they would tell her, you know, I can get other work. Uh, one guy, uh, James Rankin, he was the plumber. He literally said to Morgan, look, Mr. Hurst is incredibly late on his bills. I have had to take out loans in order to continue work for the Hurst projects. This isn't worth my time. I need to get paid or I'm just gonna leave, I quit. And another view of the pool, okay. So Hearst Castle, in the end, did not have many people quitting. It didn't have major labor events, uh, riots or anything among uh, protests among all the men. So how did Morgan manage this? We're going to look at the other pool first to understand. So the Roman pool um is based on this fifth century mausoleum the gala plastidia in ravenna italy which it's not much from the outside just like the roman pool at hearst castle it's pretty much like a concrete bunker on the outside but when you go inside it's this just feast of mosaics with this with the blue mosaics really standing out and these intersecting arches and hallways and and mosaics everywhere right and this was Morgan's take on um, the pool. So it, on the right, you see just a close up of some of the tile details. And here you can see some of the intersecting arches and intersecting pools. Um, if you see the, the starburst pattern or that sun pattern in the bottom there, you can see that 
um, is directly taken from um, the starburst pattern in Ravenna. So, okay, so Hearst, he wanted to have all the tiles, all the tile work done in Murano, Italy, a glass making capital of, of Italy, right? And Morgan, she said, well, you know, Mr. Hearst, you're always talking about uh, America first. Well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? I know of some fantastic tilers in um, tile, tile artists, mosaic artists in North Beach, the Italian neighborhood of San Francisco. And I think they would do a wonderful job. And so number one, she tried to hire local whenever she could. Now you couldn't find, you know, tile setters really of this caliber in San Luis Obispo or Cambria. Um, so she went to San Francisco, but for the general laborers, she actually went local whenever she could, she would hire from San Luis, San Luis, Obispo, San Luis Obispo and Cambria and local environs because they were used to the location. It was, Hearst Castle wasn't that far away from them. So they were happy and there were fewer jobs, right? There are fewer jobs to compete for um, in terms of like the suburban developments and things. So she hired local. So um, trivia for the day related to this pool. This is an incredibly complex set of mosaics, right? And um, so the design was created by this Italian family and then they had to be shipped. This had to be shipped somehow down to, um, to San Simeon. And so what they did is they laid out sections of the, the mosaics on pallets and they, they put them on the pallets and then they numbered them and they had this whole key to how they had to be put back together in San Simeon. And then they went down to San Simeon and very carefully unpacked them. And so here's the, here's the fun fact. So this is where um, the hall, Fugazi Hall, where the pallets were put together and crated and, and you know, set for shipping off to San Simeon. And uh, for those of you who have visited San Francisco, this might look somewhat familiar because until New Year's Eve 2019, this was the location of Beach Blanket Babylon. So Hearst Castle, Beach Blanket Babylon, who knew? Okay, so she hired locally. Morgan also gained the respect of her, uh, of all the builders and the workmen by just sheer feats of strength. As we've said, we know Hearst Castle, it was on top of a mountain. And then um, the, you can read oral histories about the builders at the site and they would talk about how harrowing it could be to get on the rooftops of Hearst Castle because you know, it's not a flat rooftop, it's the, it's the tile roofs and it was really windy. And as you can see, there are no guide rails or guardrails, sorry. So it was a harrowing experience for the, you know, the manliest of men. And, um, and one day, one of these guys, he was, he was working on the roof and all of a sudden he noticed this shadow come over him. And it was of, a woman in a dress, it was Miss Morgan. She climbed the stairs, she climbed up onto the roof. And he was like, Miss, Miss Morgan, you know, can I help you? And he's trying to get her hand and she was completely unfazed. And so that was one thing he was like, oh my gosh, this woman is up here. Um, but he also apologized, right? Because whatever he had been doing and he'd been kind of swearing uphill and down dale at the time, not very uh, ladylike language was he using or gentlemanly language. And Morgan was like, oh, please, sweetie, you know, I've heard much worse. If that's what you have to do to get the building done, you know, far be it from me to um, cast judgment on you. And so that was really important. Similarly, you know, a lot of Italians, like I said, were working on the site and uh, Sunday picnics with wine was, were part of their culture. And this is the age of prohibition. And, you know, this, this one guy, he said, Miss Morgan, you know, we have to have wine. We just, we need to have wine at the picnics. And so she didn't stop it, right? She didn't condone it. She was a teetotaler herself. She didn't stop it. She didn't condone, condone it, but she just turned a blind eye to it. 
So the point being that she showed strength of character. She also, she could talk to these guys about absolutely anything. Like her intellect was just formidable and they respected that. And she also did not try to upset the culture of the building trades. It didn't matter to her. Um, a little bit of wine here, a little bit of swearing there, whatever. She wasn't there to try to, um, you know, she wasn't on any sort of moral crusade. She wanted to have the buildings constructed it to the highest quality possible. So that's how she won them over as well. Housing. This is ramshackle housing that you're looking at at the top of the hill in the early years. So over time, she improved the housing. This is say, this is like the um, either chief engineer or chief plumbers um, house down in the village of San Simeon. So there were a few very nice houses for the top executives as it were on the hilltop. But um, she also had a, a nice bunk house constructed for the laborers. And she did more than that. She didn't just improve the housing over time. She understood that they needed entertainment. And so she took advantage of Mr. Uh, Hearst being involved in Hollywood and brought entertainment to them. Um, the food improved over time. You paid a dollar a day for basically all the food you could eat. Um, and again, the quality of the food apparently was really, really bad at first, but it improved over time. And so here, this letter says, this is October 1st, 1920, from uh, Hearst to Morgan. Dear Miss Morgan, I have a kind of an idea and I think it is practical. Instead of building up another terrace, which will never be used, would it not be cheaper and even more effective architecturally to recut the steps leading down to the terrace, making them steeper, and to add steps as shown in above diagram, and to lower the floor of the existing terrace so as to give a full view of the loggia back of it? Adding two inches to the steps alone would bring us down a couple of feet, and if we added additional steps, we could get down four feet at least. That would be equal to removing the parapet. You said was at its best for the parapet. The cost of cutting down would not be as great as the cost of building up an entirely new terrace would be. The effect might be better as the new terrace would cut out a good deal of the old, of the old one in the perspective. Then we would be relieved of the makeshift of an iron rail and a dangerously low parapet, etc. What do you think? So the point here is a fewfold. One, this is early in the history of San Simeon. But you can already tell the scale of the changes that Hearst would make. Now, it's one thing to request these just massive changes early on at the building site, but the changes were never less complex for Hearst, which could potentially create a ton of headaches. So Morgan, she obviously accommodated most of Hearst's requests, and she was known as a client's architect. She was there to bring the client's dreams to life, right? But that doesn't mean that she bent over backwards and just did whatever they wanted. And it's really important that she didn't do that at Hearst Castle. On another occasion, Hearst wanted to add another story to the main house. And Miss Morgan wrote back and said, no, we're not going to do that. We already um, accommodated, we already anticipated that you would want to add uh, more stories when we first laid the foundation. And so we tripled the foundation and you've already used up that. We are not going to, um, to do that, Mr. Hurst. And so you have a sense in this letter here, he's, he has his ideas, he listens to Miss Morgan, he respects her, and she could push back, which was really important. And then, um, so this is switching over to the University of California for a second. Um, at the same time that, that Hearst Castle was being constructed, Morgan was working with Bernard Maybeck on the Phoebe Hearst Memorial Gymnasium at Cal. And um, they finished the project on time and they finished it at the end of a particular, at, at the fiscal year, like, they, like a day after the end of the fiscal year. And so the university said, there, workers are going to have to wait three months to get paid. Well, you know, remember the plumber who wasn't getting paid? Well, Morgan turned to Hearst and said, Mr. Hearst, you need to pay Mr. Rankin 
or he's going to quit. And a week later, Mr. Rankin was paid. Well, by 1926, Julie Morgan, she was so well respected that she could take on the University of California, not just Mr. Hearst. So she wrote to the president of the University of California and said, look, basically, I don't care if your fiscal year is technically done. Um, the men completed the project early. They completed it to the highest quality possible. I need you to pay these guys. And sure enough, the University of California caved in to Julie Morgan and paid the workers. So, okay, remember what happened during the Campanile at Mills College. This guy, Camille Rossi, he was the um, chief engineer at Hearst Castle for really the most important years of construction, like throughout the 1920s. I think it's 22 to 32. And he was this larger than life character. He had this swashbuckling past, like literally he was down in Mexico and had to flee when Pancho Villa, Pancho Villa like chased him out of the country. And he had a huge ego. He was vitally important to the construction of Hearst Castle. He helped to design and construct the, um, the water system and again, like oversaw the construction of the main buildings and everything at Hearst Castle. Incredibly important guy, nobody liked him. He was a pain and he grew increasingly intolerable over the years so that Morgan was frequently having to field complaints from the various sub, um, subcontractors about how Mr. Rossi was treating them. And it was a really bad situation. So Julie Morgan went to Mr. Hearst and said, look, Mr. Hearst, it's up to you, but I really think that you need to, um, to fire Mr. Rossi. You know, the latest thing that he'd done was that he told the workers to pour concrete expressly against Julia Morgan's wishes. Uh, and timing was everything. She had everything lined up so that things would happen in a certain way. And, um, and Camille Rossi, he wrote to Mr. Hearst and said, Mr. Hearst, I do everything around this building. I know what's going on. Everything is fine. And he even wrote to Mr. Hearst's sons. And so you have this tete-a-tete, -tete, right? You remember in 1903, you had at Ford, you had Julia Morgan versus Bernard Ransom and Bernard Ransom won. Well, 30 years later, who do you think won? Julie Morgan. So she had completely, she hadn't just won over the, the authority. She didn't command the authority and won the respect of all the men who built her designs. They loved her. Like you just, you hardly see a, a negative word about Julia Morgan by any of these men who were there to um, build her buildings. And so again, um, that is fundamental to understanding how Julia Morgan could possibly have the career that she had, the way that she was able to work with the builders. So with that, we're going to go to Q&A and Leah, I think, is going to um, tell us how that's going to work. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Leah Mosteller, and I am the guest services coordinator for the Annenberg Community Beach House. I'll be helping to facilitate the Q&A portion of the event, so please make sure you type any questions you have into the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so we'll get to as many as we can before the end at four o'clock. So first, we'll start with, from the beginning, what buildings did Julia Morgan design in the LA Santa Monica area that still exists besides the Beach House? Oh, that's a good question. So um, the LA Examiner building is still standing and it is undergoing renovations for uh, the University of Arizona. It's, it's going to be a satellite campus for them. Morgan did some renovations, uh, remodeling to Marion Davies house in um, Beverly Hills, and I can't tell you the address. 
the Marion Davies Clinic is gone, the Beach House is there. Um, oh, so then, yeah, so the San Pedro YWCA still stands. And then a little bit further afield, you have the Riverside YWCA and Art Museum that still stands. Uh, and then you can go up to Santa Monica, uh, not Santa Monica, Santa Barbara and see the Lobero building, um, the Carrillo um, Recreational Center and um, the Santa Barbara County um, Department of Health buildings. They're an old sanitarium that she designed. Those are the ones that come to, to the top of my head. Amazing. All right. And then another is several sources say JM Cal Poly. Can you expand on archival sources for the research? And if so is a primary one, why is that? Yeah. So I, I love that question. So there's this myth about Julia Morgan that she destroyed all of her archives. And, and it's, it's just not true. So um, it's a myth that was started by her nephew in the 1970s because uh, the University of California, the Bancroft Library kept knocking on his door and they were kind of obnoxious about saying, please let us have Julie Morgan's archive. And, um, and, and he was annoyed. So he donated, and I think it's actually his wife because he, he died in the seventies. His wife donated the bulk of Julie Morgan's archive to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which was the next most, um, logical place to have the archive just being so close to Hearst Castle. So they have the largest collection of personal papers, project papers, like her office collection, um, her, her, the projects, they're, they're actually very, very well documented. So Cal Poly has the largest collection and then the environmental design archives at the University of California has the second largest collection um, the Bancroft Library has some as well. And then other organizations that Morgan um, built, designed buildings for, some of them, like some of the YWCAs, they have their own archives, but they more often than not have actually donated the, them to like the Bancroft Library. Um, I know the um, Studio Club, oh, the Studio Club still stands in LA as well. Um, those archives are at Northridge. Um, Cal State Northridge, um, and then you'll find them at, at large libraries here and there. But there's Amazing. there's a significant amount. And then a popular question that we have is, what ultimately happened to the Spanish monastery, the one not built in Shasta County, and what happened to the parts? Yeah, okay, so it was an enormous uh, building, right? And some of it ended up in the warehouses in Brooklyn, and some of them some of the crates made it all the way out to California. And for the ones that made it out to California, they were um, in Golden Gate Park for a really long time. Morgan wanted to reconstruct the monastery to be a medieval museum. But one woman, I swear to God, one woman thwarted that effort. And so the medieval museum was never constructed. A number of those crates uh, burned. So a lot of those stones were actually destroyed. But what did survive of those ended up in Chico. So there's a seminary in Chico where they also, they make wine and, and olive oil, um, if, if I recall correctly. So part of it, so the, uh, well, part of it is in Chico. And then another part of it was sold in the 1930s because uh, Hearst went through some serious financial uh, problems in the 30s and sold off a lot of stuff. And so a significant portion of the monastery was uh, bought by this, this guy who rebuilt it in Florida. And um, it's called the Old Abbey or something like that. I forget. But it, those are the two main places where the remnants ended up. Amazing. Okay, another popular question that there's a couple of different versions of, where can we locate the most comprehensive list of all of Julia's buildings and homes that she designed? So the most comprehensive list is at the back of Sarah Boutel's a biography of Julia Morgan called Julia Morgan Architect. It's definitely the most comprehensive list. It is also riddled with errors and has a number of omissions. Um, nonetheless, so, so always do your homework, like double check if the building actually is by Morgan. 
Um, but that is definitely the most comprehensive list. And then the other place to check for, for buildings is if you go to Calisphere, so it's C-A-L-I-S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, um, I think .org, but just Google it, just Google Calisphere, and you put in Julie Morgan in quotes, you will find 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 uh, documents, including a number of blueprints for loads of buildings, and you'll find finding aids, and so you can do that. But Sarah Boutel is the shortcut. Absolutely. Okay. Was Miss Morgan paid comparable to male architects? Yes. Yes, that's another myth to dispel. The architectural profession was standardized by the time Julia Morgan got her license, right? Having a license indicates that it was standardized. And so, you know, she had to put everything out to bid and she had to pay the subcontractors, whatever the winning bid was. She had to pay union wages to all of the workers. All of that means that she couldn't stint on how much she charged. She had many employees who she had to pay and they weren't going to work in her office if they didn't get paid decent wages, right? So she was in a competitive environment there. But what she did do for her personal income, she was definitely known to donate her time and labor. And uh, she did this especially for so many of the women's clubs and organizations that she, that she worked on. So if it only impacted her, then she would donate or reduce her um, costs. But otherwise, she was, she was in a profession where, you know, she was not uh, going to charge lower rates. Absolutely. And I do apologize to the audience. We have a large amount of questions and only time for a couple more. Um, but thank you so much for asking your questions into the Q&A. Okay, so next we have Julia is regarded in the LGBTQIA community as being lesbian, although little is known of her private life. Mm -hmm. Does the community at large recognize her as belonging to the community as well? That's a really good question. I've, I've gotten this question a lot over the years. And in recent years, it's become standard practice to say that Julia Morgan uh, was a lesbian, but the evidence is no stronger today than it was 20 years ago that she was a lesbian. Um, so what the evidence shows us is that she basically didn't have time for any personal relationships. I have never even seen her out on a date, um, let alone in a romantic relationship. So, so the evidence just isn't there. Um, there's there's one employee who worked with her for a short time in the 1930s who um, said that Morgan was a lesbian, but you can't rely on that alone. I'm curious about one relationship she had with the um, head of finance for the national YWCA. They went to Yosemite together. Maybe there's something there. Unfortunately, there's no other documentation about them, I'm looking, but I don't know. And what I can say is that Morgan definitely did have lesbian clients. And there's just, unless she just like put her head in the sand or whatever, for one client couple in particular, there's no way it could have, she could have missed that they were a lesbian couple. Um, you could just tell by the design of their house, like all of the guest rooms had separate sinks and these two women, they had separate bedrooms, but they shared, you know, Jack and Jill um, bathroom, you know, and they owned the house together. Uh, so, so she definitely had lesbian clients. There are some questions, hints, maybe possibly she was a lesbian, but really she was married to her work and didn't have any time to um to have romantic relationship perfect thank you karen all right so we have we can end on this note for the last question what was the most surprising atypical thing you have discovered in the course of studying the work of julia morgan oh my gosh wow <laughs> i don't think i've ever had that question and that's like 20 years um you know i would say it's not so much Oh no, I know what it was. Um, yeah, so so Morgan, she is 
it's renowned for not liking the press, um, for not publishing anything, uh, for just being so incredibly shy. And I was always skeptical of that whole narrative. I'm not sure how you have her career and be like practically pathologically shy. I just don't think that can happen. But um, so what I was surprised about was, you know, at one point, um, well, newspapers have been digitized and more and more newspapers have been digitized over time. And so I've been able to find out more and more, especially about her early years. And I discovered that she gave lectures. She lectured at Mills College. She lectured at Berkeley. She gave a lecture in, in San Francisco. So that was actually, I suppose, the most surprising thing. Like I knew she kind of controlled her image in the press, um, but I was surprised to find that she actually did uh, do some public speaking. Okay, and this is actually the last question, just because I do think this is important, and then we okay. will close. How can we keep up with your articles and research? Well, you can Google me. Um, there are two L's in my last name, so make sure you put two L's. Uh, so Karen McNeil and Julia Morgan, you'll find a bunch of stuff. You can go to LinkedIn and find me there. If you really, really want to get in touch with me, you can contact the, um, the Annenberg Beach House, and they'll figure out how to get my email address to you. Um, and so, um, yeah, in my next article, it's actually going to be published in a catalog that is a that accompanies will be accompanying a museum exhibit, a traveling museum exhibit that is supposed to open at the Laguna Art Museum in the fall. It was supposed to open in 2020, but 2020. Um, so that should happen. Um, yeah, I should right. have a website, but if somebody wants to create a website for me, like, let me know. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so that is all the time we have for today. After a brief credit, you will all have the opportunity to view that slideshow one more time that we showed at the beginning. A big thank you to Robin Venturelli on the Dosic Council for creating that beautiful slideshow. And on behalf of the Annenberg Community Beach House, Santa Monica Conservancy, thank you so much, Karen, and all of our guests who have joined us this afternoon. Thanks. It's been fun, I hope.